Hello and welcome once more to the International Soccer Preview by Soccer Files Canada. I'm Kevin. And I'm Connor. And today we will be updating the final round of CONCACAF qualifying for World Cup 2022 for Mexico. Um, before the round, we did a team preview and a player preview for each team. Uh, we won't be repeating all that information here, but we do urge you to check out those podcasts at our website at soccerfiles.captivate.fm. Uh, let's summarize the information covered in each of those podcasts. Uh, we gave a more detailed summary in our first podcast of this series, which was for Canada's team. Um, but I'll turn it over to you, Kev. Yeah, so we'll uh, we'll keep the summary shorter here. But in general, uh, at the beginning of this qualifying round, uh, we went through each country, a podcast for each uh, country's team and a podcast for each country's players. And in the team podcast, we gave some information on the country, so uh, geography and demographics and stuff like that. And then uh, we gave a, a summary of their history in the World Cup competition and in regional competition. Uh, we spent a bit more time looking at their recent history. In that team podcast, we took a brief look at their players, uh, kind of focused around their goal scorers. Um, and then we looked at the rankings of uh, each team and the head-to-head -head record with the other teams in the group. And we ended with a discussion of their schedule and prospects. Yeah, and for each of the player podcasts, we organized the team into positions and looked at the players who had been filling those positions in recent times. We gave some biographical information on them, uh, especially their history with the national team, and predicted who were the main candidates for each position. Again, in this podcast, we won't be repeating all of that. Uh, rather, we will be looking back on how this round has gone for each team and how correct we were in our predictions for their performance and their players. Uh, sometimes we were right, but sometimes players we expected to be used were not, and new players also came in. Right, so especially for the player podcast, uh, uh... The original one we did and this one are more companion pieces. So uh, we gave biographies for, for the players we expected. Uh, in this one, we'll only give biographies for the new players that have uh, come in. Yeah, and then finally, we will look here uh, towards the future and discuss the prospects of, of the teams and the players from this midpoint forward. Um, so let's begin. Um, here we'll be looking at Mexico after having played eight of their 14 games. Right, so not exactly midpoint, but a little bit uh, beyond it. Uh, well, let's see how they've done, uh, Connor. Yeah, they have a record of four wins, two draws, and two losses. Um, those, la those two losses coming in their last two games uh, on the road in the USA and then on the road in Mexico. Um, they currently sit in third, but just two points off first. Um, you know, they'll probably be satisfied with, with most of those results. Um, that said, you know, some of the games, you know, were a little bit closer perhaps than expected. Um, they took a late penalty to beat Jamaica in their opener and then, uh, or sorry, a late goal to beat Jamaica in their opener and then a penalty to beat Costa Rica 1-0 on the road in their second game. Um, their other wins were home to Honduras and away in El Salvador and even that El Salvador game, it wasn't really wrapped up until a, a 93rd minute penalty that uh, sealed the deal 2 0. Right. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, their last two losses again in USA and in Canada, probably their two toughest games. Uh, they've also played five of the eight games on the road. So uh, we can expect that to be kind of evened up in the second half of the schedule. Yeah, there. that's Yeah, that's right. So overall, I mean, there's not really a, a threat of them kind of not qualifying at this point, I would say. Um, but I would also say that they haven't, you know, been at their very best. They haven't blown teams away. Um, you know, they haven't run away with things. Um, you know, those couple draws, a um, couple losses on the road, um, you know, kind of, and some of the performances too. Kind of enough to get by, but um, not dominant Um you know, like they, they perhaps would, would hope or their fans, I think, would expect them to be. Yeah, I don't know if we mentioned the most salient point, which is they're currently sitting third in the table and uh, pretty much tied with Panama in fourth. They dropped down uh, from first place uh, to second after their loss in the USA and to third after their loss in Canada. But uh, honestly, like, I think people have the impression that, you know, Mexico 
and the US, but Mexico kind of dominates the region and they do. But when we did the kind of the history podcast, we saw that, you know, that wasn't always the case. Sometimes they're kind of squeaking through the region. Sometimes they didn't even make it. And uh, it's not really that unusual for them to drop some points along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they always get to the World Cup, but when you look, take a deeper look at the qualifying, you know it. Um, you know it, it does show that they they do have their challenges and that they don't they don't walk all over the region, despite the fact that they get to the World Cup in the end. You know those who kind of pay attention to the qualifying know that you know they do they do face tricky games. They do drop points. Um, you know they even drop points at home. Um, so yeah, they don't have it all their own way, and that's that's the case again here. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll take a look at those uh, upcoming games, kind of these uh, the last six games, second half of the schedule, I've been calling it. We'll take a quick look at uh, who's been scoring for them. And I think uh, uh, so one outstanding point there, Connor. Yeah. 11 goals scored from 11 different players. Yeah. Um, yeah. A couple goals from all over. Um, some names you'd expect to be there, Jimenez, Moreno, uh, Lozano, Corona. You know, they're all on the score sheet, but just the one goal so far, um, you know, for, for for everyone who scored. So a little bit surprising, eight games in, uh, no one's yet found double figures. Yeah, I mean, especially, uh, you know, especially the forwards, Funes, More and, and Jimenez, and even some of the attacking midfielders like uh, Lozano and Corona, you'd kind of expect a few more. Uh, goals from yeah for sure uh going back to that game over el salvador which said uh you said it wasn't as convincing as the score line uh they did overcome a red card there at 67 uh minutes into the game so um i suppose a two nothing win in light of that is uh is pretty good that's their only red card so far yeah yeah, after eight games, they sit with a plus four goal differential, you know, 11 scored, seven conceded. So, um, you know, perhaps not scoring as many and perhaps letting in a few more than um, than some people might have expected. Yeah, having said that, uh, it, it's hard to see them not uh, at least finishing in the top three. Yeah. Let's take a look at their uh, formations. And I think in the initial podcast, we said that they – uh pretty regularly play a 4-3-3 and um they didn't actually start that way for the first two games they started with a a 4-2-1-3 sorry a 4-2-3-1 and then uh they went back to their regular formation for uh most of the other games uh except for the last one against Canada where they played uh three defenders five midfielders and two forwards so uh, perhaps a bit of a bit more of a defensive formation uh, against Canada in in the in the Ice Teca Stadium. That's right, we were there, um, so and I we think per perhaps using wing backs in that game to counter the threat of Alfonso Davies and Tejon Buchanan, um, you know, wanting to have that extra insurance in the in the middle of defense and have a couple wing backs, you know, trying to uh, to mark those two dangerous Canadian players. Yeah, yeah, um, true enough. Okay, well, we're going to move on to players uh, here, and we'll start out with the manager uh, who we introduced in the in the initial podcast, Gerardo Martino. So, uh, any any kind of comments there? Is he in trouble after those last two games, uh, last two losses, Connor? You know, despite despite those losses and despite sitting in third, I haven't heard you know calls for his head. Um, you know, there's nothing really too remarkable there for the manager, I would say. Um, yeah. yeah, Mexico did lose an appeal of a stadium ban um, due to negative chanting by their fans. Um, so that was could have taken place earlier, but was delayed because of the appeal. But having lost that, their men's team will play their next two home games be uh, behind closed doors. Yeah, and just yes. on a personal note, we were hoping that ban would be in effect when uh, Canada visited Mexico, but um, uh, it was still under appeal, or, or I think they were they were trying to get the games to be uh, women or youth games or something like that, rather than the men's team. Yeah, and, that's right. Uh, now, yeah. 
So anyway, it looks like uh, we'll just kind of flip back and see who benefits from that. Um, no, we'll tell you at the end of the podcast who benefits from that. Let's move on to uh, talking about goalkeepers. Uh, yeah, maybe no, you can pick this one too. For sure. So no real surprise in that. Uh, Guillermo Ochoa has started all uh, eight games. Um, Rudolfo Coto has been on the bench seven of the eight games. Uh, Jonathan Orozco for five. And Alfredo Talavera, who was our starter in the Gold Cup, has been on the, fen- uh, the bench for four. Um, interestingly, uh, Rudolfo Coto um, is the youngest of these at 34 years old. Um, we mentioned Sebastian uh, Gerardo as a potentially next generation keeper coming into the picture. However, neither he nor a couple of other younger candidates have made the bench so far. All right. So it's Ochoa all the way or Choa all the way. Yeah. Uh, as far as goalkeepers go, it gets a little bit more complex when we get down uh, to defenders. So we look at the central defenders first. Uh, Mexico went with a four-man defense in all but the last game uh, there. But uh, for the first four games, the central defense was uh, Nesta Araujo. Do you know how to say that? No, I'll I'll go with Araujo as well. Araujo and Cesar Montes. Uh, Araujo was expected, but Montes was a surprise uh, since he hadn't seemed a primary candidate in our initial assessment. Uh, Veteran Hector Moreno... Um, was expected to play, um, and he did play the, the following two games, three and four. Uh, and and then, um, sorry, I'm a bit lost here, uh, was expected to play and played the next two games, and it was uh, Moreno and Araujo uh, in game six. So, strangely, they switched to new centre-backs for game seven and eight, uh, which, you know, especially considering that they were two tough away games in the USA and Canada. I got to say, uh, Connor, that was a bit of a, a baffling decision and, and they lost both games. Yeah, certainly curious. Um, you know, they, uh, you know, I think took a bit more of a defensive position. Like we said with Canada, they added in, you know, an extra defender. So curious that they would uh, make a change right at the heart of their defense. Yeah, so uh, Montes was not called up for the last three games uh, and Moreno for the last two and Araujo for game seven. So um, whether they were not available to the team seemed a bit of an odd decision to make such a big game uh, right before their, sorry, make such a big change right before their biggest games. But we will move on to uh, some other candidates. Uh, Of course, we said that the defender switch for the last two games. It was Johan Vasquez, who had only ever played two friendlies for the natural uh, for the national team, and uh, sa- uh, paired with 34-year-old Julio Cesar Dominguez, who had recently returned from a three-year absence from the national team. Uh, those two became the starters, and uh, as I think I mentioned, they were joined by Nesta Araujo in. Uh, well, it was actually a three-man back line for the last game, but as you said, uh, those wingers on the sides uh, took a bit of a more defensive position. So in our assessment, we had also um, expected Carlos Salce- Salcedo as part of the central defense, but he was never selected despite starting most Gold Cup games. Uh, if you recall from our last podcast, we had noticed that he was booed by fans. Uh, he missed a penalty, but it seemed to be a bit more to it than that. He didn't seem that popular. And uh, Diego Reyes, who we also mentioned, uh, has not appeared for the team since 2019. Finally, we uh, we mentioned uh, Gil- Gilberto Sepulveda. Sepulveda. Uh, he continues to look a future prospect as he was on the bench for four of the games here. And that is central defenders. Yeah, very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, the position at left back, um, that was quite straightforward. Um, Jesus Gallardo started seven of the eight games, uh, moving up to midfield and in the formation change for the last game against Canada. Um, and it was Osvaldo Rodriguez um, who started game six. 
Right, so uh, Gallardo certainly has nailed down that position. Uh, right backs is a little less complicated, uh, a little less straightforward. Uh, do you want to take that one too, Connor? Sure. So uh, Luis Rodriguez was expected in our initial assessment, but he only started games five and seven. Uh, he otherwise subbed into one game, uh, was on the bench for two, and was not selected for the first two um, and the last one game. Um, George Sanchez and Julio Cesar Dominguez played the position otherwise, uh, surprisingly so since they had not uh, kind of made our radar on the initial podcast. Uh, George Sanchez uh, should have given, um, should have, we probably should have mentioned him, given that he played uh, regularly before the 2021 Gold Cup. Uh, he did not make the squad for that team because he was on the Olympic roster. Uh, he played the right back position in games one, three, four, and eight. Uh, moving up to midfield role in the new formation of Game 8. Uh, 34-year-old uh, Julio Cesar Dominguez was starting right back for Games 2 and 6. As we saw, he moved to central defense for the last two games. He was an unlikely selection, having last played in the 2015 Gold Cup, except for appearing in two friendlies in late 2018. Uh, other candidates had been the veteran Miguel Layun, but he last played in October 2020. Uh, Edson Alvarez once played this position, but he has moved up to midfield. Uh, finally, Kevin Alvarez was on the bench for the Gold Cup, but he was never called up for these qualifiers. Right. So I think uh, in our initial podcast, we had kind of pegged uh, Luis Rodriguez as the, um, uh, you know, as the uh, starting right back. Not unlike Guiardo, he seemed to have the position nailed down, if I recall. But it looks like uh, Jorge Sanchez is the main candidate. Uh, right now. Yeah, it definitely appears to be. Yeah. Uh, but maybe maybe still in flux a little bit, that uh, that one. But we'll move on to midfielders and uh, take a look at the uh, uh, defensive midfielders first. Sure. So um, other players um, do step into the defensive slash central midfielder uh, role, usually, usually on the left um or right of the three-man midfield. Um, actually, I'm going to jump back a little bit. Um, yeah, actually, I may be confused with that. Uh, sometimes we combine the defensive and central midfielders. For Mexico, I think there's uh, um, room to talk about them separately, even though they're not completely separable. But they have a few players who who, who, who do focus more on defense. Sure, I'll, I'll start there um, instead. So, yeah, the mainstays are Edson Alvarez and Hector Herrera, uh, with Luis Romo taking an increasingly bigger role. Uh, the three only play Game 7 together, uh, with several other players stepping in for a game or two here and there. Um, as mentioned above and in the initial assessment, uh, Edson Alvarez used to be a left back, but his move to defensive midfield now seems to be permanent. He started six of the uh, eight games. Hector Herrera was injured for the first three, but then he started four of the next five. Uh, Luis Romo has also started uh, four matches. He is fairly new to the team, uh, being first capped in November 2019. Uh, he appeared fairly regularly after that, but was not selected for the Gold Cup. Um, rather, the 26-year-old was one of their three overage players uh, on the Olympic team. Okay, so... Um... I think Mexican fans will be jumping up and down at our classifications here. Hector Herrera being more of a central uh, and, and slightly more attacking midfielder, say, than Edson Alvarez. But uh, as we've said uh, several times before, the um, positions are really kind of a way of organizing it. And uh, players don't really, uh, you know, fit comfortably into the roles all the time. So... Uh, just look at this as kind of our way of organizing it and talking about the players. Uh, we'll move on to the central midfield uh, there. Uh, other players stepped into the defensive or central midfielder role, usually on the left or the right side of the three-man midfield. Uh, and uh, Carlos Alberto Rodriguez had three games. Uh, Andre Guardado, who we were wondering uh, would be part of this because he is kind of uh, getting old there, uh, he played two games, 
Orbelin Pinedo, who's actually an attacking midfielder, played two games. And Jonathan Dos Santos, who we expected to play more than one game, uh, but he did just play the one. And Sebastian Cordova, also an attacking midfielder uh, for one game. Of course, it is a 4-3-3, so, um, you know, it's not a surprise to have a couple of attacking midfielders in that middle three. Uh, just to go over some of those players, um, sorry, I should um, put this up here. So Carlos Alberto Rodriguez uh, was at the Olympics rather than at the Gold Cup in the summer. He's a fairly strong candidate for the position. Uh, meanwhile, 35-year-old veteran Guardado, uh, he earned his 173rd cap in Game 4 against Canada. And Connor, do you have any idea where that puts him in the in the uh, total caps by football players uh, list, ranking list? No, 173 for an outfield player is extraordinary. Uh, where does he land? Where would you say? I, I'd guess maybe top 20. Oh, good one. So uh, that puts him as the uh, 13th wow. the most capped football player in history. And if I have it right, I think he's still about 50 games behind, uh, behind uh, the top one or two players. That's still uh, pretty impressive. Uh, Orbelin Pineda was uh, a bit of an odd choice for game six and eight, as he's usually a forward or a winger rather than a central midfielder. But again, not a huge shot there. Uh, to me, a bit more surprising was Jonathan Dos Santos. Uh, he and Eric Gutierrez um, both played that position in the 2021 Gold Cup. But they really weren't factors in these qualifying games. The start for Dos Santos in Game 3 uh, was his only appearance. And on top of that, he was subbed out at halftime. Uh, and meanwhile, Gutierrez was not called up at all. Yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll move over to uh, midfielders and uh, wingers. Uh, there, the uh, and just a general comment on that. Uh, Mexico tried, you know, a couple of different formations this time, but in their typical four-three-three formation, uh, the wingers become almost like uh, outside forwards. So, for ease of discussion, uh, we're just going to combine uh, uh, combine these. Yeah. So I'll start uh, with yeah. um, left midfielders and wingers. Um, Alexis Vega, a relatively new recruit from the Olympic team, uh, started in games one, two, and six. However, he subbed out injured at the 41st minute in game two and at the 20th minute in game six. So he never really uh, got established. Uh, Orbelin Pinedo took over the position for game three and Irving Lozano after that, um, although both also started in other positions for other games. Uh, Irving Lozano who had taken an ugly head injury uh, early in the Gold Cup and was perhaps still recovering uh, when not selected for the first three games, he does seem to be the default player for the position. Uh, we also made mention of Diego Lainez in the original podcast. Having played with the Olympic team in the summer, uh, he was injured for the first three games of qualifying and then was never called up. Right. Uh, okay, well, let's move over to the uh, right side. And the main man on that side is uh, uh, Jesus Manuel Corona. Uh, he holds the position pretty firmly and started five games there. And he also subbed in early for two others. Uh, he was absent only in the first game where Roberto Alvarado had the position. And, um, sorry, uh, oh, uh, although uh, Alvarado was at best a substitute uh, after that. Uh, Irving Lozano, who we have just seen as a left wing, a switch to the right side in games where Corona did not start. And finally, someone I expected to see a little more of was uh, Uriel Antuna. Uh, he looked to be stepping into the role in 2019, but he was only a substitute here and didn't even make the squad for the last three games. Right. Um, looking at attacking midfielders, um, we identified no starters for the position in the initial assessment. Um, the central midfield role is usually played by a more defensive midfielder, um, but more attacking players uh, did fill the role with Sebastian Cordova in game one 
and Orbelin Pineda in game six. So this is kind of your, your quintessential number 10 position, which uh, Mexico doesn't always utilize. Right. Um, Henry Martin, uh, Rodolfo Pizarro, Efrain Alvarez, uh, Jesus Angulo, Luis Montez are among a few players designated as an attacking midfielder or secondary striker, but none are very active with the team. Um, Martin subbing in for the first three games and then not used. Uh, Pizarro just subbing in for a five-minute cameo appearance in game three. Uh, Angula on the bench uh, for the last game. And Efrain Alvarez not called up at all. Uh, Luis Montez, along with a few lesser names, was last called up in 2019. Uh, we spent a lot of breath on Carlos Vela, but he seems well and truly off the team now, uh, having last appeared in the 2018 World Cup. Um, he's 32 years old, so not that old, and continues to for- perform well in uh, Major League Soccer, but not really uh, in the thoughts of uh, the manager. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see whether he is finished with the Mexican team or whether his head will pop up again. Uh, we'll move on to forwards. And in the forward position, surprisingly for a team like Mexico, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, Rogelio Funes Mores and uh, Raul Jimenez took turns as the main forward here. Jimenez is probably still the default choice, but he wasn't selected for the first three games. Uh, He was available, but probably not fully recovered from that terrible head injury that we talked about. I think uh, uh, last time we said it was at the beginning of the season in 2020, but uh, actually it was in December uh, 2020. So uh, it took about nine months to recover from that and and uh, maybe wasn't comfortable for the first few games here. Uh, so Funes Mores started those first uh, games and Jimenez resumed the role in game uh, from game four, but Funes Mores got the start in game six. So um, sharing the role with Jimenez um, seem, seemingly favoured. Uh, we did speculate on Javier Hernandez, but he has made no appearance since uh, September 2019, and he appears to be off the team. Alan Polito is also mentioned. Uh, we talked about him as a, an example of how difficult it is to break into the team. Uh, and as an aside, Connor, I think if there is a theme for Mexico here, it kind of is that theme, how many players they have, but how difficult it actually is for those players to break into the starting lineup. And uh, that proved true here, as uh, Polito didn't get a sniff of it. He wasn't called up for any of these eight games. Yeah, it is interesting. I think the Gold Cup and the Olympics and other tournaments, Mexico has a lot of opportunity to try out different players. But, you know, it seems that the World Cup or the World Cup qualifying, you're right, it is hard to kind of break in, um, you know, with kind of the, the lineup. And I think a lot of this st- starting lineup does does play overseas in Europe, so they will use more domestic-based players in the Gold Cup and, um, you know, again, for other tournaments. But um, you're right, kind of displacing some of those European-based players, you know, playing at teams like Wolves and Atletico Madrid and Porto. It's, uh, you know, those are the ones they kind of rely on for their most important games. Right, and we must have talked about it in the initial team podcast that, you know, Uh, A lot of times, like this summer, they're playing two tournaments. So this time it was the Olympics and the the Gold Cup. In 2017, it was the Confederations Cup and the the Gold Cup. And uh, a lot of times uh, it's been the Copa America uh, along with the Gold Cup. So they certainly have all the players to cover those tournaments. But uh, it's, it's honestly a bit surprising how few of those uh, players selected for the B team um, make their way up into the A team. Okay, well, we usually finish by looking at any uh, key substitutes, uh, any new players or any notable absences here. But uh, uh, what ones there were, uh, we cover, we've we covered. So uh, the substitutes are kind of made up of players who, who didn't... Uh, start all the games but maybe started some of the games i don't recall any new players here connor do you no not really not uh, not ones that we hadn't really covered previously in the initial podcast yeah i mean again uh, kind of uh, a sign of how tough it is to break into the team and then the noticeably absent uh 
um, we we kind of covered as we went there. So we're going to move directly on to uh, the default lineup here. Um, again, usually it's a bit more than 11 players because players share positions, but we'll try to keep it as simple as possible. Here we go. Take us yes, through it. Starting in net is Guillermo Ochoa. That one is really, there's no questions about that. Um, central defenders, like I said, they... They've, they've tried different uh, players, but Nestor Araujo and Cesar Montez appear to be the two starters with uh, with Hector Moreno also coming in. Yeah, and just a little asterisk on that. Uh, again, they they changed that for game seven and eight, So, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if they go back to these veterans. Yeah. Um, the left back is locked down by uh, Jesus Gallardo. And then right back, um, you know, Jorge Sanchez, the primary candidate with Luis uh, Rodriguez also coming in. Um, in midfield, Edson Alvarez and Hector Herrera, um, as well as Luis Romeo, um, you know, I've seen a lot of game time. Um, Carlos Alberto Rodriguez would be another name uh, in consideration. Um, and then for the attacking three, um, it tends to be Irving Lozano and Jesus Corona on the left and right side. And then as we mentioned, Raul Jimenez and, and uh, Rogelio Funes Mori kind of alternating um, as a lead forward. Right, and that is a pretty powerful uh, lineup of players, as you say, a lot of those guys uh, playing in Europe. Uh, anything to add on players, or should we move uh, to their upcoming fixtures? Yeah, let's talk about their six games that remain. Okay, well, as we noted at the beginning, four of them uh, are at home, so that's four out of six games uh, being played at home, I think that should pretty much assure them of a top three spot. And three of those are in a row uh, after they play Jamaica away uh, in their next game. Uh, it's Costa Rica, Panama, and uh, USA, which is, is kind of the um, the highlight game, I guess, left in this qualification. And, and then they of, finish at home with El Salvador. Go ahead, Connor. Yeah, the game against USA, a bit of a grudge match, having uh, lost the first one on the road. Um, yeah, they've also played Canada twice. They won't play them. They actually only took one point from their two games against Canada. Um, so kind of showing how far Canada has come, as, as we've talked about in that podcast. Um, yeah. But, you know, for Mexico, they have that game at home to the U.S., um, but they don't play any of the other, the current top two after that. Um, as you mentioned, four of six at home, they're playing primarily, you know, teams below them in the standings. Um, so not really a threat for them not to qualify. They are tied on points with Panama for third and fourth. Um, but I think with the home games and just their schedule, you would you would favor them to um, to qualify comfortably. Yeah, I think that uh, that uh, pair of games at home to Panama, followed by at home to USA, will pretty much define uh define the uh qualification for them and I, I my guess is that um um they'll kind of leave panama behind them uh, at that point and then depending on what happens with mexico and usa that'll be uh, kind of crucial for where they finish relative to each other yeah absolutely um you, you know they've played eight games they've won four of them um, so they have dropped points, and I, I expect more points to be dropped. But but on the whole, you you generally expect them to win their home games and away games against Jamaica and Honduras. Those are two of the bottom three, so very possible they get three points there. Well, at the beginning, we expected Mexico to be, uh, you know, the top team and, and maybe by uh, a few points, but uh, they currently sit in third. I, I, I think we'll both agree that they probably won't end up in third. But uh, will they end up in first, Connor? I'm going to say yes. That was my uh, prediction um, at the start that they would win. Um, that they would win the uh, the round, um, and I think with their schedule and their home matches, they'll do so. Um, you know, as we've said, they're not going to run away with it, and you know, it, it's possible that they may settle, you know, somewhere, you know, second or third, and, and still get through. But I would expect them to be top two and realistically i expect them to finish strong and to finish first okay well i forgot to use my faux impatience uh, to mm -hmm. ask you that question so uh, i'm gonna switch it to this give it to me straight connor you've been dodging all along who's gonna give them the biggest fight canada or the usa 
I'm going to say Canada. I think Canada has proven um, tricky so far. Um, you know, I, I think the, there's a lot of emotion going into that U.S. game. Um, but, you know, Canada, ha you know, they're done with Mexico. There's not a chance for Mexico to take any more points off them. So I'm going to say Canada finishes second and USA third, but Mexico tops a lot. All right. Well, I like to hear uh, Canada being favored there. We did mention that uh, up at the top there that uh, their next two games were in empty stadiums. So it looks like Costa Rica and Panama uh, will benefit from that. How much of a benefit will it be? I think it will give a psychological boost to the opponents. The Azteca is such an intimidating atmosphere to go into. Um, so I think it will be a psychological boost. Um, you know, whether that can uh, overcome perhaps the gulf in quality between the teams, I'm not sure. But, you know, as a as a player, you'd rather play in an empty stadium than a, than a full, you know, full Azteca. So, um, yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting. You know, if, if Mexico are going to stumble, you know, it would probably have to be at that you know, for those two home games, if they were really kind of going to be dragged into a dogfight, I think they'll win. But um, yeah, it's another another reason to uh, to watch those two games. Right. I think that does uh, make the game a bit more interesting rather than kind of a guaranteed win for Mexico. But I'm sure with that ruling, uh, they were definitely relieved to be able to uh, play at home in front of their fans against the USA. I think that would probably be the most important thing to them. Yeah, and like you said, we'll probably have a, the biggest impact on their final position. Great. Okay, well, I think we have covered that uh, really well. And um, once again, I'm going to say it slowly for our listeners. We do have a website uh, now, and uh, we'll kind of improve that over the next few months, uh, I hope. But for now, it is Soccer Files at Captivate.fm. So I'll spell that out. Uh, soccer files is with a ph so it's uh, s o c c e r soccer files p h i l e s dot captivate c a p t i v a t e dot f m maybe we should work on a, a bit of a simpler web address connor yeah we'll we'll get there um, <laughs> but yeah check it out that's where all our podcasts are posted and i'll see you next time kevin you betcha. See you, Connor. Thanks for uh, joining here. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.